Hello, Danny Bly from the College of Integrated Chinese Medicine looking at multiple sclerosis. Remember this is for acupuncture students only, please pause and read this. We'll start with an overview of multiple sclerosis. We'll look at etiology in Western medicine, well it can tell us about our diagnosis. We'll look at etiology in Chinese medicine. We'll look at the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. We'll look at diagnosing multiple sclerosis according to Chinese medicine and we'll look at treatment strategy. So multiple sclerosis is essentially the demyelination of the nerves. So it's a bit like the plastic protective coating being stripped off in electric wiring. Symptoms are quite varied depending on which nerves are affected and in relaxing and remitting most common type um, there can be some partial healing. In relapsing remitting MS, which accounts for about 85%, there are attacks and then periods when it calms down again. And in about half the attacks, some symptoms are left behind. In primary progressive, which accounts for 10 to 15%, um, the symptoms gradually increase. And this tends to be in later onset MS. And relaxing remitting eventually may turn into secondary progressive where the symptoms gradually increase and this tends to be 20 plus years after getting the symptoms and this period is gradually increasing with better medication so the idea is to stabilize the relapses and stop people from moving into this secondary stage if we look at who gets it two and a half million worldwide cases, 127,000 in the UK, and seems to be gradually increasing. Onset usually 20 to 40 years old, usually diagnosed 30 to 50, so it takes them some time to diagnose it. Um, it tends to be grouped in areas. You can see um, USA, Canada, Northern Europe, um, Australia and New Zealand have the highest incidence. So there's some environmental factor. It's less common in coastal dwellers. It's almost unheard of in some indigenous populations. So for example in Canada where rates are really high, the Inuit people don't seem to get MS. And the same in Australia with the Aborigines and New Zealand with the Maoris. Uh, also interestingly, people who migrate before puberty share the places incidents whereas people that migrate after puberty share their homelands incidents so it seems to be something that happens in interaction with the environment in puberty that predisposes you to getting it so most common in caucasians and especially those of northern european ancestry so the vikings um, BAME sufferers seem to reach a disability level earlier at the moment, and that may be um, genetics or it may just be later diagnosis and treatment. There's some heredity, so 0.35 chance of getting it. The general population increases to a 3 to 4% chance if a first degree relative is affected, and um, almost three times as common in women, so there may be some. Um, hormonal influence here as well. So what causes MS? Um, there's some environmental, some genetical and some hormonal factors but what causes it is still unknown. The most common theory at the moment is reactive lymphocytes leading to immune mediated inflammatory disease. Areas of investigation include some sort of uh, viral infection, herpes or Epstein bar virus creating some sort of autoimmune response and also looking at light levels and vitamin D deficiency because of the um, amount away from the equator the, the, the connection with that. In Chinese medicine this is also complicated with underlying um, predispositions and triggers. The acute stage seems to be external damp invasion uh, channels being invaded by dampness. Um, 
for this to happen and become a chronic disease there has to be some sort of internal damp so we look at um, stagnation stress and uh, western diet as being uh, things that could predispose you also weak kidneys so there may be some inherited aspect of this and what we could loosely regard as western lifestyles a high stress bad diet um, overdoing it not getting enough sleep and shock and trauma may be a part of this may be a, a part of pre of unlocking the predisposition symptoms that affect the muscles and the limbs we can have num numbness and tingling caused by damp invasion or by blood deficiency we can get stiffness heaviness squeezing edema of the limbs caused by damp we can get weakness of the limbs we can get electric shock feelings spasms jerking and tremor caused by liver wind and we can get poor balance and coordination more likely to be caused by yin deficiency of liver and kidney and some burning sensations associated with heat another cluster of symptoms around the eyes and this is often the first symptoms to occur in younger sufferers so blurred vision flashing color blindness where there's a red green color distortion um, painful eyes involuntary rapid eye movements and double vision so again in terms of chinese medicine liver involvement liver yin deficiency liver wind blood stasis other symptoms fatigue and exhaustion are very common so damp and deficiency dizziness and vertigo are very common yin deficiency phlegm wind constipation difficulty swallowing muzzy head and brain fog associated with damp also get a lot of what we would consider kidney symptoms so sexual dysfunction and bladder problems with frequency urgency tendency to get frequent infections incomplete emptying nocturia incontinence so we would think about kidney chi deficiency or yang deficiency here with a tendency towards damp heat and then symptoms that affect the spirit so poor memory and thinking um, harder to to learn and to plan a tendency towards depression anxiety mood swings emotional lability slurred speech difficulty of finding words so we're thinking about syndromes like heart chi deficiency liver chi stagnation um, heart blood or yin deficiency so to give an overview at the early stage often involves external damp and this might also involve phlegm give us dizzy symptoms and it may be combined with heat so this is the early stage this is predominant um, in the more chronic stage we see a deficiency of spleen and stomach chi and a deficiency of kidney and liver yin with obviously the damp and phlegm depleting spleen and stomach chi and heat depleting kidney and liver yin we also as we've seen get some kidney yang symptoms you have to remember that these come from the same pot through the jing so if one is deficient the other will be somewhat deficient and then at the later stage the complications that we see are blood stasis which can come from some of these deficiencies and liver wind which can again come from kidney and liver yin deficiency so we'll look at these each of these in a bit more detail so damp damp heat which may or may not have phlegm as a complication the limbs will be heavy with numbness and tingling as often starts at the feet um, and sometimes the hands and slowly moves upwards to the knees and to the elbows so damp has this habit of starting low and gradually coming rising up the body might be small motor movements might be difficult and the balance might be disturbed might be poor coordination 
If there's phlegm around, we might have the eyes involved, so the retrobulb and neuritis, double vision, blurred vision, um, might even be loss of vision in one eye as an initial symptom, um, colour distortion, and dizziness. And this dizziness will be like being on a ship or being in a room that's spinning around, quite severe dizziness. There might be a muzzy head, energy might be low and that heavy, groggy feeling, hungover feeling. Um, there might be some edema, a tendency towards bladder infections, and things might be made worse if the weather's damp. So we use points like spleen 9, 6 and 3, 3 especially for the head, 9 especially for the lower body, stomach 40 for phlegm, bladder 22, triple burner 10, gallbladder 34, good for clearing phlegm, REN 9, and lots of others as well, but this gives an example. Spleen and stomach chi deficiency. In the limbs, the main symptom is weakness of the limbs and eventually foot drop. So it often starts with the tie in channels. So the lung channel becomes weak and it's hard to open jars and grip things. The spleen channel becomes weak, you lose strength in the legs. And then the yang ming, so the yang ming is full of qi and blood. So the stomach, the legs get weaker and harder to extend the legs, um, harder to hold up the head and, and foot drop. And with the large intestine, um, same thing with the arms, lifting up the arms becomes weaker. Also get poor concentration and memory, tiredness, typical symptoms of spleen sheet deficiency like loose stools, poor appetite. And things tend to be worse for activity and worse for overdoing it, but at this stage a short recovery. So getting tired if overdone, but r relatively easy to recoup that energy. Typical points, stomach 30, 31, 36, REN 6 and 12, large intestine 10, excellent point for the arms, um, bladder 20 and 21, spleen 3, do 20 to raise the chi. As we move into deeper deficiency with kidney and liver yin, the limb symptoms get more severe, so wasting, weakness, stiffness, poor coordination, balance and mobility. Uh, weak back and knees. Might also get dizziness, which is more mild, persistent, poor balance, um, feeling unsteady on the feet and dizziness that's milder. Might get some tinnitus, some night sweats, might be heading in towards more kidney yang deficiency with impotence, um, edema, and the tiredness here has a longer recovery. So if you overdo it, it's not a good night's sleep and feel a bit better in the the next day it's more takes a few days to recover from from overdoing it might be remember that yin deficiency contains blood deficiency so we might get signs of blood deficiency with pallor um, heart blood deficiency with sleep disturbance and poor memory and liver deficiency with tired eyes postural dizziness and this might head more into kidney chi and yang deficiency with urinary symptoms, urgency, um, hesitancy, um, incontinence. So the sort of points we might use, kidney 3, 6 and 7, REN 4, bladder 23. We might be using some of the extra channels like the du mai, the dai mai, the chao mai. Looking at the later complications, we can have liver wind. So tremor, spasm, um, might even get to paralysis, rapid eye movements, jolting or electric feelings in the limbs, jerking limbs, and more severe numbness, tingling, and ticks. So we might use points like liver 3, gallbladder 20, large intestine 4, do 14 and 16. Um, blood stasis, again, usually a later complication. We get rigidity, pain, more severe symptoms, purple veins, um, purple general discolour of the limbs, cold extremities. We might use points like spleen 4, 6, 8 and 10, bladder 17, pericardium 6, liver 3. Here's the schematic of multiple sclerosis again. It's important to remember that we might see patients who just have a couple of these syndromes um, and we want to keep them as healthy as we can and, and try and prevent them from going into any of the deeper syndromes. Um, so this represents a kind of overview of what the possibilities are. 
Um, you may see patients with just very mild signs of spleen chi deficiency and some damp. You might see people with very complicated syndromes with lots of these different um, secondary causes of disease and pathogenic factors complicating the diagnosis. In terms of treatment strategy, I can't overemphasize how important it is to treat at a constitutional level. So supporting the constitution, supporting the spirit, um, keeping somebody well. Um, obviously there's a lot of anxiety and depression associated with a diagnosis like this, but also minimi minimizing the chances of relapse. And although there's no firm evidence on what causes relapses, anecdotally um, stress, any sort of acute illness, getting a bladder infection, um, getting a cough or a cold, or just generally getting run down is um, is much more likely to bring on a relapse. So managing some of those things is really important. Tr treating the relevant syndromes. We've talked about the syndromes and the points that you would use. Obviously tonification technique or tonification with retention for the deficiency syndromes. Um, in the early stages, reduction or even technique and middle stages, even technique for the for treating things like damp and phlegm and treating the channels locally um, you can help a lot by actually treating the channels specifically and for multiple sclerosis i'd really consider 10 to 12 regular treatments before assessing the results the results are very cumulative so don't just treat somebody two or three times um, treat them for a longer period and then assess what what good you're doing it's also important to consider the progression from full to empty and back to some more mixed condition and fullness, especially if you're treating somebody long term. So damp obviously leads to spleen chi deficiency and vice versa and leads to some stagnation of liver chi, which eventually will stagnate the blood. Damp heat, the heat will deplete the kidney and liver yin. Chronic disease eventually leads towards kidney deficiency, kidney and liver yin deficiency. Uh, will lead towards wind and kidney yang deficiency will aggravate the blood stasis as will, as will blood deficiency. So local points can be really useful to get the chi and the blood flowing, to unblock any pathogens from the channel, to strengthen the deficiency. Um, especially the yang ming channels as these are the ones that are full of chi and blood but whichever ones you find are deficient or blocked. So the arm, especially large intestine points, but can be other channels as well. And they often combine like a couple of large intestine 10, large intestine four with a lung point, lung nine or lung seven. Um, with the leg, see Yang Ming stomach points, stomach 36, stomach 30, stomach 41, really important points, but other channels if they're um, affected. And again, I would mix stomach points with a spleen point to balance things up. It's also really important to treat the back. So um, for the upper body, the Huato Jaji points that are found at half the sun from the spine, T1 to T5, do 14, do 12, really important. For the lower body, bladder 23 and 32, and all of those points around the sacrum, do three and four, and the Huato Jaji points around T 12 to L4 can be really important. Also the Dumai, the Daimai, and the Yin and Yang Chao Mai can be really important. And although it's not something I use, scalp acupuncture a lot of people find very useful. Also in terms of treating the channels, you might consider if there's problems with the ankle, helping with balancing up the, the muscles that stabilize the ankle. You might consider treating the any foot drop directly because if there's foot drop then the person's much more likely to trip and that can lead to all sorts of problems uh, so treating that with the muscles and relevant points can be useful um, the same with the with the wrists uh, and also for numbness you can do hair needling so needling superficially um, underneath areas of numbness and sort of spreading the needles around the area of numbness can be useful. Thanks for listening. Here's some references uh, where I got some of the facts and figures from and photo credits.